Hey everybody, we're going to get started now. Thank you for coming out this evening um, to this program, an all-American total solar eclipse. Kevin is a gifted astronomer, having worked as a consultant with NASA. The Chandra X-ray Observatory launched on the Space Shuttle with the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysic astrophysics and other ground-based observatories. Kevin won national and international awards in his field and was both a Wright Fellow and an Einstein Fellow. And he did some work with the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Besides the numerous workshops he's presented over the years at libraries, observatories, and science centers, some noteworthy ones include those made at Tufts University, State University of New York at Stony Brook, the National Science Teachers Association National Convention, American Association for the Advancement of Science Breakfast with Scientists, and the National Park Service. Please welcome Kevin Manning. Thank you so much, um, Emily. Uh, I want to thank Emily for inviting me to the library uh, here. and. Uh, it's a great library, and thank you all for coming in spite of the bad weather. Um, tonight's program is uh, it's going to cover a lot about the uh, total eclipse, so don't worry about that. That's a big part of the program tonight. Uh, but we're calling it Astronomy for Everyone, Size and Scale of the Universe. So we're going to be talking about the universe from the very small to the very large and everything in between as well. I always like to begin my program with a quote from a famous scientist. In this case, you all know his name. The Hubble Space Telescope was named after this gentleman. Equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls the experience or adventure science. The word science comes from a Latin word, sciere, S-C-I-R-E, which literally means to know. And uh, if, uh, if you don't mind me saying, uh, please check your cell phones and make sure they're all turned off. And also, no recordings are to be made of my program, no photos, no videos, or anything like that, okay? Thanks so much. So as we dare to look up and wonder at the splendor of a starry sky, the appeal of astronomy may be beckoning. Submit to it in the slightest, and you may get hooked. Once you do, the universe and your place in it will never look the same. Astronomy is an experience that allows us to pace ourselves, so take heart. You can go as slowly or as quickly as you like. The universe is a very patient place, one that doesn't mind waiting while we take the first steps towards understanding. If we stare into the night long enough, gaseous nebulae begin to emerge, and glittering star clusters show up on the scene as well. If we continue staring into the dark night, perhaps a blazing fireball briefly interrupts the calm. How many have seen meteors before? Yeah, we call them shooting stars, though that's a misnomer. They're not stars at all, but little pebble-sized pieces of rock traveling through space. Through a telescope, we can see much more. How many have seen the rings of Saturn in a telescope before? How many would like to see the rings of Saturn? Yeah. <laughs> it really is a life-changing experience for many. You don't want to miss it. The cloud belts on Jupiter is also very intriguing, and frankly speaking, the craters on the moon would stun even the most composed beginner. And it gets better. The bigger the telescope, the more light gathering power it has, allowing us to see even deeper into space. Suddenly we see colors on the planets and the polar ice caps on Mars are within easy reach, as well as hundreds of galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters. How's that, is that better? You still hear me in the back? Okay, good, all right. So this is what we call an orrery. It mechanically represents the relative positions of objects within our solar system. You know, back in the days of Ptolemy, we thought the Earth was the center of the entire universe. We got such big egos, we human beings, don't we? We got to be the middle of it all. But Nicholas Copernicus showed us later from his calculations that the Earth wasn't the middle, but the sun is indeed the center of our solar system. So a paradigm shift occurred in our history, one from a geocentric understanding of the universe to that of a heliocentric one. So here's the uh, sun in the middle, orbited by, by planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, with the third rock from the sun, and then Mars. Beyond the orbit of Mars, you might notice these little specks going around the sun. Though they're really large rocks called asteroids within the asteroid belt. 
Leftover debris of the solar system's formation over the last 4.6 billion years. Beyond the asteroid belt, we have the Jovian worlds, the gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Any Star Trek fans here? Oh good, I'm not alone. Now, few of you in this audience are old enough to remember the original series when it came out in 1966, and we're all grown up already. Hey, we're no spring chickens anymore, are we? But you know, I, I fell in love with the first show, and I watched it faithfully the whole three years it was on air. I was quite disappointed when they took it off television. Obviously, a lot of people agree with that sentiment. They've come up with a number of Star Trek motion pictures, haven't they? So there's William Shatner, Captain Kirk in the middle, and on the right there, Chekhov. I want to talk about Chekhov in a moment, but before we do, let's take a moment to talk about the moon. And oh, and before that even, let's mention about, uh, you know, last year was the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. 2012 marked the 46th anniversary, and that year it was celebrated by Google. Anybody catch that? Well, you might recognize Spock's pointed ears as the letter G there. Let's watch together, shall we? Can you hear that in the back, all right? Okay. Lieutenant O'Hara, I presume. Anybody remember the trouble with Tribbles? Little furry creatures? That was a great episode, right? <laughs> Here goes uh, Captain Kirk, a first engineer, Scott, Scotty, down to the alien world. You know there's trouble waiting for them there. Of course, Captain Kirk will come to the rescue. <laughs> yeah, that one's called the Borg. <laughs> Did you notice Scotty was in the middle of all that action? He got beat up pretty bad, didn't he? Poor Scotty. Yeah, Google did that. Now, there's a reason why I brought up Star Trek besides all the fun. Chekhov always remarked about the distance of their destination aboard the USS Enterprise. Not in light years but in the biggest measuring stick used in all astrophysics. It's called the parsec. One parsec equals 3.26 light years. Now, we often put a metric prefix in front of that word. For example, there's 1,000 grams in a kilogram. So one kiloparsec, or KPC, is 3,260 light years. We even have a megaparsec, a million of them. But even that measuring stick is dwarfed by the size and scale of our universe, as you will plainly see in this evening's program. So, since you and I can't go aboard the USS Enterprise and venture out to these distant worlds, how do we know so much about them? Well, we begin by using our eyes, don't we? There's a close-up photograph of you and I. We're not used to seeing it this close, are we? As a matter of fact, from this closest, it looks a bit creepy, doesn't it? And here we see the color part of the eye, the iris, and in the middle this aperture opening known as the pupil. How many have ever noticed your own pupil change size in the mirror? Yeah, you know, bright sunny day, the pupil is rather small and squinty. Dark night with few lights around, it'll open up to a maximum of 7 millimeters, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. So to enhance our vision, we use the telescope, the primary tool of the astronomer. When it comes to optical or visual astronomy, there are two basic designs. These two on the upper right of our screen uses a lens, so when light comes through that lens, it is bent or refracted, converging as a cone to a focus back at the focal plane. Because that design refracts light, we simply call them refractor telescopes. These two on the lower left of our screen uses a mirror at the bottom of the tube. Light comes in a basically hollow tube and strikes the surface of that mirror, which is curved inward like a spoon, we call that a concave curve. And by virtue of that curvature and that reflective surface, light rays will also converge to a focus. Well, because that design uses mirrors that reflect light, we simply call them reflector telescopes. Here's sunlight reflected off of the moon, traveling all the way back to the Earth, right through the slit opening of our dome of our observatory at the speed of light. Do you know the speed of light is the fastest thing we know of? 
it's 186,000 miles per second. And if we go metric, it's even worse, a bigger number. But what does it mean to go 186,000 miles per second? Can you still hear me in the back? Okay, good. Well, it means we can go around the Earth, not once or twice, but seven and a half times in one second. The speed of light will take us from the Earth to the moon and back, round trip, in less than three seconds. How many would like to visit the moon in 1.3 seconds? <laughs> That's the speed of light. And at that enormous speed, how far will we go in an entire year? Well, that's a light year defined. We can easily calculate it knowing its speed. We can multiply that large number of times as seconds, minutes, hours, and days in a year. What do you get after all that math besides a possible headache? Well, a very large number. It's just under 6 trillion miles in one light year. And I'm not talking about the deficit, which is all the triple that and growing, right? 6 trillion miles in a light year, that's an awful big measuring stick. But the parsec is the biggest of all. So, our telescopes, reflectors and refractors, like the top middle one there, sort of reminds me of binoculars. Anybody here own a pair of binoculars? Yeah, you know they're great for bird watching, sporting events, the local high school football game. They're also great for astronomy. Do you know binoculars are nothing more than two of those refractor telescopes mounted side by side? The lenses on the front of our telescopes are doing all the work. These lenses are five times larger in diameter than the pupil of our eye reaches at maximum opening. Five squared, 25 times the light collecting area of our eye, revealing hundreds of stars that were totally invisible to the unaided eye. How many want to see the invisible? I got both hands up and feet. That's why we astronomers build bigger telescopes all the time, to enable us to see more of the invisible fainter and dimmer stars further and deeper out in space. So knowing that, instead of this pair, how many would rather look for this pair instead? Yeah, I think we're voting for the big ones, right? The size of those larger lenses compared to the smaller counterparts. They're going to gulp in and concentrate to a focus a lot more light than a smaller pair could, revealing hundreds of stars in this pair that were totally invisible with this one. With this pair of binoculars, we're going to see the rings of Saturn craters on the moon like we're going to land on with the Apollo astronauts, and dozens of other galaxies as well. So I'll put these up here. I don't think they'll block your view of the screen, but put them there. And at this point, the question may be begged, how big do our telescopes really get? Well, let's visit Mauna Kea, Hawaii, and take a look at the Keck Observatory, where we see the Keck Telescope amongst others. Even though it's Hawaii, it's a frozen world up at this high elevation. Telescopes, such as the giant Keck Observatory in Hawaii, are like time machines, capturing the faint light that has traveled toward us through all of cosmic history. The deeper astronomers look into space, the farther back they see in time. Well, as you can see, the Keck Telescope is about the size of a house. We're building much bigger ones today, however. Now, it's a good idea to send telescopes into space, and we certainly have. This is known as NASA's four great observatories. They're all space telescopes. I've had the opportunity to use some of these instruments. In 1990, we launched the Hubble Space Telescope, seen here on the right now. It doesn't look that big up there on the screen, but it's actually the size of a school bus. It operates primarily in the visible region of the spectrum, revealing images like this one of the Cat's Eye Nebula. 1991, we launched a Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. It operated in high energy regions of space, gamma rays. 1999, it took three attempts, but we finally got the Chandra X-ray Observatory in orbit on a space shuttle. I worked with that one with the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. 2003, we launched the Spitzer Space Telescope, which operates primarily in infrared. You see, in modern astronomy, we will look across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, all the way from radio waves to gamma rays and everything in between. Gives us many more various perspectives on these objects, lots more data and information, including the physical laws that govern their motion, like 3C321 seen here. This is really a composite of four separate images, each taken in a different part of the spectrum.
In radio emission, we're witnessing polar jets coming out of a supermassive black hole. In infrared as well as visible light, we're observing the merger of two colliding galaxies. Well, we could tell a lot more about what's going on in the real physical universe employing this method, so we use it routinely. So how big do our telescopes really get? Well, I was a consultant for NASA. Let's ask them, shall we? A telescope bigger than a galaxy, presented by Science at NASA. More than 400 years ago, Galileo turned a primitive spyglass toward the sky and in just a few nights learned more about the universe of unseen things than all of the scientists and philosophers before him combined. Since then, astronomers have been guided by a simple imperative, make bigger telescopes. As the 21st century unfolds, the power of optics has grown a millionfold. Telescopes cap the highest mountains, sprawl across deserts, fill valleys, and even fly through space. These modern giants provide crystal clear views of stars and galaxies billions of light years farther away than anything Galileo ever saw. Each breakthrough in size bringing a new and deeper understanding of the cosmos. It makes you wonder, how big can a telescope get? Would you believe bigger than an entire galaxy? At the January 2014 meeting of the American Astronomical Society, researchers revealed a patch of sky seen through a lens more than 500,000 light years wide. The lens is actually a massive cluster of galaxies known as Abel 2744. As predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, the mass of the cluster warps the fabric of space around it. Starlight passing by is bent and images are magnified much like an ordinary lens except on a vastly larger scale. Lately, the Hubble Space Telescope, along with the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, has been looking through this gravitational lens as part of a program called Frontier Fields. Frontier Fields aims to explore the first billion years of the universe's history, says Matt Mountain from the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. The question is, can we use Hubble's exquisite image quality and Einstein's theory of general relativity to search for the first galaxies? The answer seems to be yes. At the AAS meeting, an international team led by astronomers from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias and La Laguna University discussed Hubble and Spitzer observations of the Abel 2744 cluster. Among the results was the discovery of one of the most distant galaxies ever seen a star system 30 times smaller, yet 10 times more active, than our own Milky Way. Bursting with newborn stars, the firebrand is giving astronomers a rare glimpse of a galaxy born not long after the Big Bang itself. Overall, the Hubble exposure of Abel 2744 revealed almost 3,000 distant galaxies, magnified as much as 10 to 20 times brighter than they would normally appear. Without the boost of gravitational lensing, almost all of those background galaxies would be invisible. Abel 2744 is just the beginning. The Frontier Fields program is targeting six galaxy clusters as gravitational lenses. Together, they form an array of mighty telescopes capable of probing the heavens as never before. Galileo, eat your heart out. Well, a telescope bigger than a galaxy, quite a lofty claim, isn't it? Um, now, Let's take a moment to talk about the moon. You know, even though it looks like you reach up in the sky at night and grab a hold of the moon, it appears so close. And relatively speaking, it is our nearest neighbor by far throughout the entire cosmos. But it does like 240,000 miles away from the Earth on average. Now, a lot of people try to measure the moon in the sky, you know, using a dime out of their purse or pocket, or maybe, like this young lady, a tape measure. Yeah, you know it can't work, right? Because if you hold the tape measure closer or further from where we're looking, it changes everything, doesn't it? It's all perspective. So how do we do it? Well, in science, we like to use models to illustrate abstract concepts. This small blue sphere I hold in my hand actually represents something much larger, the entire night sky. We call it the celestial sphere. In fact, we're standing on little blue marble earth in the middle of this ball, looking up at night and recognizing all these star patterns called constellations. 
Well, for those of you who play the piano, you know there are 88 keys on a piano. There are also 88 official constellations up in the night sky, all the way around. Just a coincidence, but a rather remarkable one. Now, that was determined back in 1930 by the International Astronomical Union, not likely to change anytime soon. We should get used to those 88 constellations. Here they all are. Now, what if we drew a line once around within our night sky? You know, a circle contains 3 to 60 degrees. What if we used a part of that circle? You know, angular measure to measure the moon like a pie slice up in the sky. That's exactly how it's done. So what is the average angular diameter of the moon in the sky? It's one half degree of arc. You know, the back of our pie slice, a piece of our circle, one half degree of arc. Knowing that, how many full moons side by side would neatly fit around our circle completely one time? Say it loud. Who said that? You're quick on your feet or you're off your feet for that matter, right? Yeah, 720 moons to do that just like. Now, early in the morning it rises in the east, and later in the evening it sets in the west, our star of the sun. You know the photosphere, the surface of the sun, emitting all that bright light back our direction, also serves a form of disk in the sky that is on average one half degree of arc in angular measure. <coughs> How could it be that the sun and the moon appear to be the same size in the sky. Yeah, and that difference of distance has been way overstated by some people, that the sun is 400 times further away from the earth than the moon is. But it also can be overstated that the sun is 400 times larger in physical diameter than the moon is as well. So you see, the size to distance ratios are precisely identical. And if it wasn't for that fact, we would not experience a total solar eclipse as we do. And that would have been major consequences for Albert Einstein. How many seen a solar eclipse before? Okay, quite a few of you have. I know you'll never forget it. I never will mine either. They're extraordinary events. So, the moon orbits the Earth in one month. Yeah, that's where the word month from, actually. It's called one synodic month. 29 and a half days to go around the Earth one time. And as it does so, it doesn't trace out a circular path, but more of a flattened circle we call an ellipse. Well, with that shaped orbit, it's easy to see why the moon would be closer to the Earth at some points than it is at others. Those closer points we call perigee. When a perigeal moon aligns with a full moon phase, the moon will appear a bit larger and brighter in the sky. We call it a super full moon. How many have seen one of those before? Yeah, aren't they great? Now, we don't hear much about when the moon's out further in its orbit. Then it's called apogee, when an apogeal moon aligns with a new moon phase, and in particular, a rare event that can only occur during a new moon, a total solar eclipse. Something extraordinary takes place. I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. But what happens is the moon, being further out in its orbit, appears a little bit smaller than average in the sky, not quite big enough to cover the largest sun's disk beyond it, if it's an eclipse, leaving an annulus ring of fire around the edge of the moon. We call it an annular solar eclipse. How many have seen one of those before? Have you really? Good for you. You know, I'm surprised that you see any hands up, but even if one or two saw it, that's, it, it is a rare event. To see an annular solar eclipse and any particular geographic location, it, it, like New Canaan, Connecticut, it happens only once every 360 years. Well, we don't live that long, do we? So if you catch one in your lifetime, you're doing well. I've caught one dead center, but I travel a lot. That's my excuse. So let's watch this event together. This is an annular solar eclipse from uh, 2010. I'm sorry, May 10, 2013, I think it was, right? It was uh, what, not visible for us here in the United States, but it was visible in other places like Australia. And as the rising eclipsed sun comes up in the eastern sky in Australia, we see this ring of sunlight around the edge of the moon. It's an annular solar eclipse, a special kind of solar eclipse.
And because the moon is moving, orbiting the earth, it changes position, leaving the area of the sun eventually. Now, as this event rises in the early morning clouds of Australia, the little water droplets acting like tiny little prisms, bending or refracting the light across the colors of the rainbow or spectrum. We call it prismatic dispersion. Can you see the colors? Now, a total solar eclipse is an entirely different animal altogether. What you're seeing here is the moon. This is the moon. Behind it, the sun is playing peekaboo. This is when the moon is closer in its orbital path, this time big enough to cover the entire sun's disk behind it. And we see the atmosphere of the sun, this beautiful butterfly-shaped glow known as the solar corona and the very powerfully strong magnetic field of the sun going out into space, the magnetic field lines causing those lines and shapes in the solar corona like we see here. Well, a total solar eclipse is really an incredible event. Uh, I've seen a few of these. Uh, I'll describe the first one I saw back in 1970. Uh, I was having lunch. It was a bright, sunny day, blue sky, horizon to horizon, not a cloud to be found. I finished lunch about 1.30 in the afternoon. I came outside, and all of a sudden, it began to get dark out. And I noticed people walking down the street, looking at their watches, scratching their heads, because they're thinking, wait a minute, it's 1.30 p.m. How could it be getting dark out already? It's a total solar eclipse. You look up in the sky and you see bright stars and planets up there. And you look around the horizon, all the way around, 360 degrees, and it looks like a sunset wherever you look. And above that, this eerie, silvery hue. It's otherworldly, like you're on another planet for a little bit. The temperature may drop 10, 20, even 30 degrees reaching the condensation point in the atmosphere, where even though there's not a cloud overhead, it begins raining water drops. The animals, the neighborhood dogs are barking. The animals in the woods are screeching, hooting, and howling. They don't know what to make of this either. It was a bright, sunny day, and all of a sudden it gets dark out. It's a total solar eclipse. It's a fantastic experience to see one. It's off the charts. You would never forget it for the rest of your life. During a total solar eclipse, we can see uh, behind the moon the edge of the sun, and around the edge of the sun, we see these reddish protrusions. They're called solar prominences, ejections of this electrically charged particles, ions, with this matrix called plasma. Same phase of matter we see in lightning bolts and stars like the sun. And all of those solar prominences, they're called, collectively are known as Bailey's beads. You can see Bailey's beads during a total solar eclipse, particularly if they have a special kind of filter called a hydrogen alpha or H-alpha filter. Then they show up like you see here in stark relief. Now when the moon just begins to uncover the sun while it's moving across compared to the sun in the sky, allowing a little tiny sliver of sunlight to peek through one of its valleys in a crater, it creates what is commonly referred to as the diamond ring effect. Can you see the diamond ring? Yeah. Yeah. Now, because this is the first one across the United States in nearly 40 years, yes, this is a big deal, ladies and gentlemen, a very big deal. As we draw closer to the event, you'll be hearing about it every day on local, national, even international news. They'll be having a heyday with this event. People have been planning for this event for years in advance, and they're already in place. And because it's going across the United States, it's all about us this time, is being called an all-American total solar eclipse. 
Notice the date, August 21st, 2017. That's this year. That's this summer, isn't it? So we got an opportunity this year to catch up on our solar eclipse experiences, don't we? Now, this is the path of totality. Along this 76-mile wide shadow band, which represents the direct shadow of the moon blocking the sun where it reaches the earth. And it's going across the land. Now, it enters here in Oregon, just south of Portland, going into Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, uh, Missouri. There's Kansas City at the southern edge of the shadow. Also entering into Tennessee, uh, clipping a little of uh, Kentucky, too, I think. Uh, there's Nashville uh, in the southern part of the, the shadow as well. And then just barely clipping northeast Georgia and out South Carolina. Now, uh, you and I don't live near that shadow, do we? But everybody that lives in that shadow band in the United States, all they have to do is go in their backyard and they will experience a total solar eclipse. You might think it's not fair. Well, you can make up for it, right? You can travel to that shadow band from here. I know, we're up here in, in uh, you know, Connecticut, and we'd have to go all the way down to here, maybe South Carolina or, or Kentucky or something. But you definitely want to go to that shadow band. Should we go? You bet your lifesavers we should. If school's in session, students, skip school. Parents, adults, take the day off from work. <coughs> Trust me, there is nothing in the classroom or at work that can replace the experience of a total solar eclipse. Don't even think about it, all right? The day is yours for that event. Now, make sure before you go that the weather's going to cooperate in the spot you're choosing to go to. If it's cloudy, don't forget about rain. If it's cloudy, it's all bets are off. You won't see the event. You gotta have clear, blue, sunny skies to do this, all right? So if you check the weather a few days before and it looks promising, pack the bags. Go down there. It will change your life. It's phenomenal. So how about the people in southern Texas or northeastern Maine? They're jealous of you. You're a lot closer than they are. They got to go over a thousand miles to reach that shadow band. It's going to be a long trip for them, probably a couple of days. How about all the people north and south of this shadow line? Well, they will experience a partial solar eclipse, where we can see the moon here is partially blocking a part of the sun. Here's some sunspots on the surface of the sun. There is a partial eclipse. Cool? Of course it is. But it's nothing compared to a total solar eclipse. There's no comparison. There really is not. So, as we prepare for this event on August 21st, we should start building maybe a pinhole viewer out of a shoebox. Or maybe get some of these solar eclipse glasses. Don't they look fashionable? Now, you can't see anything in this room with these because they're filtered so that they're safe to eliminate all the bright light from the sun and block all of the harmful rays, every one of them. So when you wear these any day of the week and you look up at the sun with them, it's totally safe. And the sun looks like this orange ball up in the sky. It's really cool. So solar eclipse glasses. Here's someone modeling the glasses. And you might be thinking of getting a pair of solar eclipse glasses. Guess what? I've got a few hundred of them here with me tonight. So if you're interested, let me know after the program. I've got them available, all right? I'm not giving them away. I'm sorry. I'm charging. But it's not, a, it's not a high price for them, okay? Now, take a look at your packets here, everyone. I want to uh, thank Emily for making these copies for us. On the front cover there, you see the Andromeda Galaxy. We're going to be talking about Andromeda in a short time. And uh, near the bottom of the page, you'll see my website, lookuptothestars.com. Now, if you go to my website, it sort of looks like that. And if you scroll down to my homepage, you come to a, a book I recently wrote on how to build a telescope. Yeah, a lot of people were asking, because I, on the side as a hobby, I build telescopes just for fun. 
And uh, yeah, it's really a, a, a neat experience. It's a lot of work, but it's a fun experience. Especially if you're like me, you love working with wood. And you build one of these types with a wooden mounting. That's called the Dobsonian. It's a lot of fun. So it doesn't look that big on the cover of this book, but this telescope is as big as me. It really is powerful. It's an eight inch reflector, five and a half feet long tube. And uh, it's very powerful. It gathers 500 times more light than the unaided eye. So you see stars 500 times dimmer than the unaided eye. It's over 100 pages long. I wrote it with a person in mind who knows absolutely nothing about telescopes. So I got you covered. Because I covered every single step on how to do it successfully. I think I did it well because, believe it or not, a third grader named Nicholas seen here with his mother Donna, actually built this telescope using my book. I'm really tickled that he did that, you know. It's prettier than mine. Mine's just a plain white tube. He painted his, these neat blue and gold checkerboard colors. He even ground and polished the eight inch mirror. Now, if you've ever tried to do that in the past, you know it's a lot of work, right? It's about a hundred solid man hours of work. Well, I've done one and I can tell you, it, it, for him to do that, he had some help from a local astronomer and I look through the telescope and it performs very well. It'll last him the rest of his life. Another book I wrote that I ran out of copies of is called 101 Fun Facts on Astronomy. Now turn to your, page, your next page of your packet and you see a daily observation log. You can Google that and come up with a million of these, but I created this one myself from scratch. So tonight I'm giving it to you. Copy it all you want. But some of you might be thinking, well, what are we putting all those blank lines? What kind of data are we looking for here? Turn to the next page, and you'll see instructions for completing the daily observation log. I try to be detailed and comprehensive enough with those that you'll find this tool user-friendly at home. And then finally, turn to the last page of your packet, the sky show. What can we see during the day with our telescopes? Well, if we're careful we could look at the sun. Now normally looking at the sun is not a good idea. It's so bright, it's dangerous, it could even blind us. Don't do it. But using proper filtration or projection methods, we can see the sun safe like you do here, an orange ball. Now watch what happens when I set this image in motion because it really is video footage. Yeah, the sun spins and rotates on its axis a bit like the Earth does. Uh, it, though it's slower than we are. Near the equator of the sun, it rotates once about every 25 days. Near the poles, it's even slower, about 33 days. We call that differential rotation. And notice these dark blotches on the surface of the sun. Anybody know what those dark blotches are called? Yeah, go ahead. Good job, young man. What's your name, by the way? Justin. Justin. Thank you, Justin. Good job. Justin got it right. They're called sunspots. They're magnetic storms that align with the magnetic field lines coming up from the core of the sun where they meet the surface. And because they're magnetic in nature, they overform in these groups or pairs. Now, those sunspots don't look that big up there on the screen, do they? But what if I tell you they're bigger than the Earth? They're much bigger than our entire world. There's a nice sunspot group on the left side of the sun in this view. What if we zoom in on that group in ultra-high definition? Then this is what we see. Notice in the middle of each sunspot, we have this dark central region called the umbra. What does umbra sound like? Umbrella, right? It comes from the English word umbrella. Yeah, the umbra is the direct uh, uh, or the dark part of the sunspot there, surrounded by a lighter shaded region known as the penumbra. Same two terms we use to describe both the direct and indirect shadows of the moon blocking the sun during the solar eclipse. So, notice on the sides of the sunspots, the surface of the sun itself appears rather mottled. We call it solar granulation. After all, the sun's a very hot place, you know. In the core where the heat is coming up from, it's 27 million degrees. That's hot enough to burn our bacon in the morning, wouldn't you agree? Now here's a single sunspot that's gonna split and divide into two right before our eyes. Sunspots are magnetic storms, so they do have polarity. You know, like north to south poles of a magnet, so they often migrate into these pairs. 
We call the process sunspot mitosis. I know, we borrowed a term from biology, which describes a human cell dividing into two daughter cells, you know, via binary fission. But this isn't a human cell. This is a sunspot bigger than the Earth. Now, here's the sun in ultraviolet, and right here is an area of a sunspot. Watch it closely in this real video footage. How many have heard of a solar flare before? And here's the sun in infrared. Again, right there is an area of a sunspot, too. Watch it in this real video footage as well. Now, that was definitely an ooh-ah moment. Some of you missed your cue, but that's okay. You know, the magnetic field line suppressing the material below until the pressure builds and it explodes forth with these electrically charged particles, the ions, in that matrix known as plasma. A lot of the plasma raining back down to the surface of the sun from its tidal forces or gravitational pull, and covers the area seen here on the screen that doesn't look very large, but it's actually bigger than the distance from the Earth to the moon, hundreds of thousands of miles. Here's the Earth model size comparison next to one solar prominence loop. An ejection of plasma looping back around within that magnetic field. Good thing we're not too close to the sun. And here, using a space telescope, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, the SDO, we're witnessing amongst these swirling colors what is known to be a magnetic thread, leading to not only a solar flare, but also a coronal mass ejection, a CME event. Yes, the sun has this atmosphere called the corona, and it too will break forth with these electrically charged particles. If they're facing our direction when they're emitted, they will reach the Earth in short order, a day or two. And when they arrive, they could disrupt radio communications. They can also produce the conditions for an aurora. How many have seen the northern lights before? Aurora borealis, the northern lights. Aurora australis, the southern lights. They migrate toward the poles of the Earth because that's where the magnetic field lines are coming out, so they're attracted there. So let's take a look at this uh, northern light event back in mid-March of 2013 together. <clears throat> now at first, we're going to look at the sun using a special type of filter, so it may appear a bit odd. Now let's zoom in on that sun and try to find that culprit sending all of that energy packing our way. There he is. He's really a tiny sunspot. He's even smaller than the Earth, but he sent a lot of stuff our way. Now the solar wind is not like the wind on the ground of the Earth blowing leaves around. But it is these electrically charged particles, mainly protons, flowing through space. They blow back the tails of comets, for example. Here, here using a fisheye lens from one horizon all the way across the sky to the other, you're looking at the entire sky, a much bigger view than we could fit in our eyes normally. We often see these green, red, and violet colors associated with an aurora. And the way they interact with the upper atmosphere with all of its turbulence, and even beyond with the magnetosphere in space, they often form what appears to be rippling curtains in the wind. And there the entire sky ablaze with the northern lights. If you and I were there real time, we would be totally awestruck. And there is our rural display. And another view as well. Now, you and I have a lot in common with stars. We're very much alike in some ways. Stars are born, they live, and they die. Though they tend to live a lot longer than we do, millions, billions, even trillions of years. 
Chaos and dust within what we call a molecular cloud inside of our own Milky Way galaxy coalesces together. And as the particles are brought in tighter by the pull of gravity, they begin to swirl around and move faster, increasing kinetic energy and therefore temperature. When the temperature reaches a few million degrees, it will trigger a nuclear reaction known as fusion. Yes, stars burn and glow by fusion power. But who's being fused? The lightest, most abundant element found throughout the entire cosmos, hydrogen. You think three quarters of the universe is made up of that element, is being fused into heavier elements such as helium, carbon, oxygen, even iron. So what happens to this newly formed star when it goes through all of its initial hydrogen fuel supply? Well, the other balance force in the equation, gravity, takes over. And the star's core begins to collapse. But at the same time, it will trigger burning of heavier elements created through the fusion process, which burn hotter than their lighter counterparts did beforehand. So overall, the star will expand larger and larger reaching red giant, possibly even super giant stages, engulfing its own inner planets if it has any, like our own sun is destined to do to Mercury, Venus, Earth, yes, even out to Mars. <coughs> Don't worry, not for five billion years from now. Today the sun is stable, but five billion years later we're in trouble. So let me show you in this visualization everything I just described for you in a newborn star. First, it begins fusing hydrogen, glowing with its own power. When all that fuel supply is used up, the core begins to collapse. But now it begins burning these heavier elements on up the chain, which are burning hotter, so the star expands larger. Now, when it reaches iron vapor in the core, there's a problem. Iron is so heavy, it won't release energy. It only absorbs it. So gravity takes over, and the star's core begins to collapse in about a second of time, triggering a horrific, catastrophic explosion. Oh, so a little emphasis here on a supernova. Yes, in a moment of time, more energy has been released from this exploding star than had been burning in the previous millions, even billions of years beforehand. So bright are these supernovae. We can see them in distant galaxies, millions of light years away. The remaining gas and dust debris of our stellar explosion actually enriching that area of space so that the deaths of old stars can ultimately lead to the births of new stars. Stars glow with their own power, so we call them luminous objects. Other objects, such as planets, moons, asteroids, comets, are only illuminated by reflecting nearby starlight. Our nearest neighbor who does that with the sun, the moon. Though it looks like you could reach up in the sky again, it appears so close to grab it. But again, it's 240,000 miles away from the Earth on average. The whiter, brighter, biggest part of a full moon face we see in the sky is known as the highlands. The highlands are potmarked with hills, rills, mountains and valleys, and numerous impact craters speckled across the lunar landscape. Impacts from rocks like meteoroids and asteroids over the last 4.6 billion years. Well, needless to say, the highlands part of the moon is a very rough textured part. Not a good place to land if you and I were an astronaut. So we'll need to go up in a different part of the moon. Maybe up here where you see these darker, smoother plains known as maria or seas though they're not oceans of water at all like we once supposed them to be, but they are oceans of molten rock, magma, filling in these basin areas for volcanic activity long ago. The largest maria, 700 miles in diameter, almost the size of the state of Texas. How many of you remember hearing of the Sea of Tranquility before? Yeah, you know why it's familiar to many of us? Because in spite of what you've heard, read, or watched on TV, we have absolutely irrefutably walked on the moon. We'll probably go back. Anybody want to go? <laughs> Anybody want to go to Mars? But not on a one-way trip like being proposed out there? Yeah. Do you know 200,000 people signed their name to go to Mars one way and never return home again? I don't know what they're thinking. Don't join them. Anyhow, what would it be like to walk in an airless world like the moon? What would we need to survive such a trip? <laughs>
A space suit, right? Do you know the Apollo astronaut space suit weighs 180 pounds? But on the moon, it only weighs 30 pounds. Because the moon's a lot smaller than the Earth, less gravity. You would weigh one-sixth what you do on the Earth on the moon. How many ladies want to go to the moon right now? How many men, too? Yeah, right? Well, and what is the color of the face shield on the astronaut's space suit? I think I heard somebody say gold. It's real gold. Gold is expensive, but we're worth it. The thin film of gold has actually affected us blocking all the harmful rays coming from the sun and out of space, protecting our eyes and our face. Gold works. Now, the entire right-hand half of our screen here, this big orange bowl, is the sun using a solar filter. So what could this dark little bowl be silhouetted there in front of the sun from our line of sight back here on Earth? Who could that guy be? Good job. That's right. It could be Mercury. Mercury is closer to the sun than we are. As a matter of fact, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun of all. And it orbits the sun in a mere 88 days. Hey, there's that number 88 all over again, isn't it? Yeah, it comes up a few times in astronomy. Now, uh, because Mercury orbits the sun every 88 days in its yearly journey, it can happen every now and then where it'll line up with the line of nodes, we call it in physics, and it'll pass right in front of the sun's disk from our line of sight back here on Earth. We call the event a transit. Now, how many heard about or maybe even saw the transit of Mercury last year? Anybody? All right. Well, do you know only 13 transits of Mercury occur per century? Yeah, every 100 years, there's 13 of them on average. It's a pretty rare spectacle. Now, this is not a transit of Mercury, so who else could it be? Venus, that's right. Venus is the only other planet closer to the sun than we are. Mars is further away. That wouldn't work. But Venus is closer. Hey, we're the third rock from the sun, right? Well, this is a transit of Venus from 2004. How many heard about the transit of Venus, June 5, 2012? Did you see it? And you guys see it? You did? Good for you. Good for you. That was a great event. Well, how many wish they saw that event? How many would like to catch the next transit of Venus? Yeah, but here's the problem. Venus is out further from the sun in its orbital path than Mercury is. Takes 225 days to orbit the sun one time. That means it's a lot less often a much rarer event to see what we're seeing here on the screen now. The next transit of Venus, 105 years later. The date, 2117. Be sure to mark it down in your calendars. Now I got a piece of bad news associated with that event. It won't be visible for us here in the United States. We'll have to wait eight additional years to see the next transit of Venus from here. How many plan on catching that event? Hey, I'm with you guys. You might as well think optimistically here. What do we got to lose, right? Well, for those of us who may not make it to the next transit of Venus, how would you all like to see the summer event of 012 like no human eyes alive could have ever imagined seeing a transit of Venus? Using NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, ultra-high definition images, we're going to see Venus encroaching on the sun's limb from the left side of the screen, first in visible light, traveling faster than real time, it took Mercury seven and a half hours across the sun's disk last year. Venus is similar, hours to go across. Using special filters and detectors, we can look at the view at different frequencies of the spectrum so the sun appears different. These are sunspots below the path of Venus above. We are actually using this transit method to discover and identify new planets orbiting distant stars in our exoplanet survey.
How many feel vindicated now? <laughs> now, Google also gets into this exoplanet survey business, too. Um, how many heard about the recent find a few weeks ago of seven planets nearly the size of the Earth orbiting a star 40 light years away? This is an artist's rendition of those seven worlds. Of course, it's just guesses what they really look like. But uh, you can see their sizes are accurate, and uh, some of them are about the size of the Earth, some a little smaller, some a little bigger. There's our four uh, terrestrial planets in order from the sun there uh, to represent size and scale. But yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating. Jupiter, the biggest planet by far in the entire solar system. It's 11 times larger in diameter than the Earth, and yet its day is less than half of ours. Jupiter spins and rotates on its axis in a mere 9 hours and 50 minutes, stretching along these stripes known as cloud belts. I was hoping to show you those cloud belts on Jupiter tonight. It's up in the early evening sky along with its moons. We can see them easily in the telescope. Our second largest planet is Saturn with its majestic rings. And in between the bright ring sections, we see this dark appearing gap known as Cassini's Division. And up near the pole of the planet, this luminous arc visible there, it's actually an aurora. Yes, we see them in other worlds such as Jupiter and Saturn. Saturn's a lot further away from the sun than we are, averaging a distance of 0.9 billion miles from the sun. So it takes nearly 26 years for Saturn to orbit the sun one time. That means every year we catch up to it. And when we do, we get different angular perspectives of the rings of Saturn. This year, 017, they're tilted maximum our direction in our line of sight, so it looks great in the telescope. This is a video montage made up of many images of Saturn, taken up close and personal by the Cassini spacecraft and the Eugens probe. A lot of people think the rings of Saturn are made up of gas and dust, but they're really hundreds of trillions of icy blocks orbiting that world, kept in their beautiful patterns and configurations by the tidal forces of these little shepherd moons. Speaking of moons, we have one moon orbiting the Earth, though it's of high importance to us. Without it, I dare say, we would not be here tonight. Saturn, on the other hand, has 63 moons orbiting that world at last count. Here's the biggest one of those. It's named Titan. It's nearly the size of the planet Mars. It has an atmosphere and it has water. Ask me later how we know it has water on it. Titan is the second largest moon in the entire solar system. And as Saturn flips around in our view, we come to this other sizable moon called Mimas. It has a large impact crater on the side facing us here. Now, this is not art. This is for real. This is like you and I jumped aboard a spacecraft and visited Saturn in person. The same thing. Mars, with its polar caps and dark areas like this one known as Sirtis Major, of high interest to all because we believe long ago Mars was more Earth-like than it is today, having a thicker, denser, more robust atmosphere and an abundance of water above its surface. Well, we sent a number of spacecraft and probe toward Mars in the last few decades. What are we looking for up there? Yeah, water on Mars, right? No, I'm joking, but how many heard we found flowing water on the surface of Mars? It's true. It's real. And how many are familiar with the recent spacecraft a few years ago that landed on Mars, the Mars Science Laboratory and the Curiosity Probe? Do you know a sixth grade female student named it Curiosity? It's a great name, isn't it? Her name is Clara Ma. And when Clara entered ninth grade three years later and it landed on Mars, August 5, 2012, don't you know this young lady was having the time of her life meeting astronauts and all kinds of people? Young people, you can make a major contribution to science.
curiosity is over nine feet long. It literally weighs a ton. It has 10 scientific instruments on board. It's greater than any three missions sent to Mars previously combined. Anybody remember Voyager 1, Voyager 2? Well, Voyager 1 did something in recent years that changed history forever. Let's watch together, shall we? Voyager 1 has left the bubble around the sun and entered interstellar space, the space between stars. It's amazing that Voyager has operated 36 years. 40 years this year. Launched in 1977. Traveled past the gas giant planets. And now off into interstellar space. A radio telescope took a radio image of the Voyager 1 spacecraft, slightly over 11 billion from the Earth. And it's a very small radio dot amongst a, a sea of darkness. We have an instrument on Voyager which can measure the density of the ions, the plasma which is uh, out there. In March of 2012, it turns out there was a massive eruption from the Sun which eventually reached Voyager 1 in April of 2013. When that blast wave reached Voyager, it caused the plasma around Voyager to vibrate or oscillate in a certain particular tone. Literally, they're the sounds of interstellar space. And by measuring that sound wave, we could measure the density of the plasma and we're amazed to find out that we were in interstellar space. This is a historic milestone in the great journeys of exploration that have been undertaken by humankind. Well, it is quite remarkable when you think about it, that far off now at ever increasing distances, there's this little vehicle, two of them, which were built here uh, many years ago and launched uh, 36 years ago, now on a journey that will basically last for billions of years. The bubble Dr. Stone was talking about is called the heliosphere, and the outer perimeter, at least theoretically, it's known as the heliopause. Think about it. We built spacecraft decades ago, one of which now was over 12 billion miles away, has entered a region of space outside of that influence from the sun called interstellar space. It's a first in the history of humankind. Now, way beyond Voyager 1 are stars in the Orion Cygnus arm of our own Milky Way galaxy, forming these asterisms or patterns in the sky. They can be recognized here, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is not a constellation, but it's part of one known as Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Seven stars makes up the Big Dipper, three in the handle and four in the bowl, and these two at the end of the bowl, opposite the handle, are commonly referred to as pointers. Line them up and keep going that direction off the screen, and they point in the general direction of our current North Star. Who knows the name of the North Star? That's right, Polaris. How many heard that Polaris, the North Star, is the brightest star visible in the entire night sky? How many heard that before? Don't be shy. Most Americans have heard that. That's why I like to bring it up in my programs, because it's totally not true. Polaris isn't even close to being the brightest star, not by a long shot. So what's the name of the real brightest star visible in the entire night sky? Are you serious? That's why Sirius is its name. S-I-R-I-U-S is how we spell it. We call it the dog star because it's part of the great dog constellation, Canis Major. It's even up in the early, the winter sky. It's even up now in the spring still. Well, what came first, the star or the satellite radio company? Don't we tend to name things as the astronomical objects, the four galaxies, the Mercury comet? And what's the name of our galaxy? Milky Way. Sorry, candy bar lover. Now, it's also been said that the handle of the Big Dipper arcs toward Arcturus, a big, bright orange color star in the sky. Now, some may recognize the pattern of Orion the Hunter here in the sky. And up near the armpit of the giant, this red supergiant star named Betelgeuse. And down here in the lower right of Orion is this blue star called Rigel. And in between the two brightest stars in the constellation, we see these three in a row, 
forming the belt of the hunter. Now he is a hunter looking for prey, so he does have a weapon. Below the belt, we see the sword of Orion. These three stars making up his sword. Notice the middle of the three, however. Gee, it looks a bit fuzzy, doesn't it? That's because it's not a star at all, but it's a cloud. And the word for cloud in the Greek is nebula. So we call it the Orion Nebula, 1,500 light years away. It's literally our nearest stellar nursery where new stars are being born. Double stars like Albireo and Cygnus of Swan appear to be close together in the night sky, but thinking about it three-dimensionally, one could be a lot further away from the Earth than the other. That's the case here, and that's where we merely refer to it as an optical double. But notice the colors of the pair, orange and blue. And artists would tell us those are complementary colors. They're opposites. And an artist would paint on the canvas of their painting, red representing hot areas and blue cold. But in astronomy, it's just the opposite. Red stars are the coolest stars. Blue stars are actually the hottest stars of them all. Most stars are not like the sun being a lone star, but are binary pairs or multiple star systems, like Alpha Centauri, our nearest star system to us. In this binary pair simulation of Algol, we're seeing two stars so physically near each other in space that by their mutual tidal forces, they're sharing material between them. And as they orbit a common center of gravity from our line of sight back here on Earth, we notice periodically one star partially eclipsing the light of the other. So distant is the pair that it only appears as one star even in our biggest telescopes. So when one star partially blocks the other star like it is here, it will appear a bit dimmer in the telescope. When it get widest apart like they begin to be now, it will appear a bit brighter. So like a roller coaster over time, they get brighter and dimmer. And that's why we call this situation a variable star. Open star clusters are loose collections of tens to even hundreds of hot young stars, like the Pleiades star cluster seen here in the shoulder of Taurus the Bull. How many heard of the Seven Sisters before? Yep, it's commonly called the Seven Sisters. Native American Indians call it the Seven Dancing Girls. But truthfully, there are 250 member stars in that cluster. Far outnumbering that, however, are member stars of a globular star cluster, like Messier 13 pictured here in Hercules, resolved right through the core of over a million old stars. Well, I like to think of these globulars as sort of like chandeliers going around the center of our galaxy, way out in this region known as the halo. We see a few hundred of these there. We also see them routinely in other galaxies as well. Nebulae appear differently, partly for the way they are formed. If a star blows out its outer layer into space as a roughly spherical shell of gas and dust, it will resemble somewhat the appearance of a planet. And that's why we call this type planetary nebulae. Notice the colors of Messier 57, the famous ring nebula in Lyra. They are real, and they tell us much of its composition. Diffuse nebulae appear spread out like a puff of smoke every which direction we look, like the Orion Nebula seen here, as it would appear in a modest-sized telescope, as we may see it from home. Well, would you like to see what it looks like in a really big observatory telescope? Looks more like that. On the left, Messier 43, it's known commonly as the Christmas Tree Nebula. On the right, Messier 42, the Great Orion Nebula, with large amounts of filamentous structure, features and details, resolve throughout the entire cloud. And as we dive down even deeper into the heart of the cloud by the power of the Hubble Space Telescope, we now have photographic evidence of what we only theorized to exist decades ago, the existence of these protoplanetary disks. The gas and dust within the cloud coalesces together, begins to spin and rotate to conserve momentum, flattening like a pancake, drawing material from around it nearby, and that's what we call it an accretion disk. In the middle of our accretion disk, a new star will be born once it reaches a temperature of fusion, orbited about by new planets in a new stellar system. Now, we could take a spacecraft into the Orion Nebula. A lot of us think it would look something like this. And as we enter the heart of the cloud, we come to these four bright stars known as the trapezium. They were born out of the cloud themselves. You can see the trapezium from home in even a small telescope. 
And as we make our virtual journey through the Orion Nebula, we go by these rather peculiar looking objects. We're going to zoom into this next one. At first, it resembles a Pepperidge Farm goldfish cracker. <laughs> but that will dissipate away, leaving behind our accretion disk, vertically aligned like a spinning wheel. In the middle, a new star will be born, orbited about by new planets in a new stellar system. Perpendicular to the disk of material is the area of least resistance for escaping energy and gas in regions known as polar jets. Also within the boundaries of Orion the Hunter, we see this dark cloud with this brighter backdrop silhouette, almost curtain-like in appearance in this magnificent photo. What does this dark cloud look like to you? Of course it looks like a horse. What else? A dragon. It sure does look like a dragon. Yeah, like a cobra. I totally agree. It looks like a cobra snake. A, of course, a seahorse. I think it really does look like a seahorse. Anything else? Yeah, the headless horseman or the horseless headsman or however that goes. Yeah. Yeah, like a swan. Well, the point is, astronomers have a vivid imagination. The Milky Way, the Big Bang. Come on. What is the consensus in the astronomical community of what that dark cloud looks like? A horse's head. Personally, I think it looks like a night piece on a chess game or maybe a seahorse. But as we zoom in on the horse head nebula in Orion, you can always hear the neigh of the horse. Now here's our own Milky Way galaxy, and as we zoom into its core, we believe exists a supermassive black hole, a monster. And notice these dark pocket regions around here. They're not gaps between the stars like one may think, but they're thick, dense areas of gas and dust, opaque, blocking the starlight beyond. And as we pan out and go down one of the spiral arms of our own Milky Way toward our neck of the woods, we come back to Orion the Hunter, and we see again the Orion Nebula and the three belt stars vertically aligned. Let's flip them horizontal again and draw in a bit tighter. And we can see the position of the horse and nebula in proximity to the constellation as well as the entire galaxy. This red glowing material we're seeing is ionized hydrogen in a region known as Barnard's Loop. And as we come back to the horse and nebula, we can see even closer to this belt star, this bright reflection nebula known as IC434. This stands for index catalog. It's commonly called the flame nebula. And as we paint a short span of sky, we come back to the Christmas tree and Orion nebulas again. This is not art. This is for real. We're seeing the glow of the Orion nebula brighter than ever seen before in history. And the stars of the trapezium shining brighter than ever seen before as well. Now we paint another short span of sky to come to a Hubble photo that broke international headlines overnight. At first, it looks like a UFO, but it's not a flying saucer. It's our accretion disk, as described. Flat like a pancake, horizontal in our line of sight, we see the glow of a new star undergoing fusion both above and below the disk of material, from whence new planets will form, orbiting that new star in a new stellar system. Now, everything I've talked about up till now is inside of our own Milky Way galaxy. Way beyond the Milky Way are hundreds of billions of island universes known as galaxies, like the Andromeda galaxy on the cover of your packet. Two million light years away, it's actually one of our nearest neighboring galaxies to us. But two million light years is an awful long distance. We're looking at the glow of its stars as they really appeared two million years ago in the past. Yes, telescopes are only reveal the invisible. They're also a time machine. They take us back in time. Two million years ago in history, a mere drop in the bucket compared to what the Hubble is showing us today. We're looking at stars and galaxies that are 13.2 billion years old. The Andromeda is a lot like our own Milky Way being a spiral galaxy. It's bigger than we are. Some astronomers think there's a trillion stars in that system. And notice the two smaller companion galaxies with the larger system. Do you know we also have a couple of smaller companion galaxies with our own Milky Way? Who would have guessed that the Portuguese navigator sailing the southern seas a few hundred years ago, Ferdinand Magellan, would have had them named after himself for their discovery? 
How many heard of the clouds of Magellan, the largest small Magellanic clouds? Of high interest to all, because relatively speaking, they are so close. And as we zoom into the core of the Andromeda galaxy, we're reminded that we're in a collision course with it. How many have heard that before? Yeah. It's true. You can write it down. We in the Milky Way are going to collide with the Andromeda. Don't worry. Not for four billion years from now. Again, we're off the hook. We don't have to lose sleep over this tonight. But four billion years later, we're going to have to contend with a galactic collision. Can we survive it? We actually can. How many can't wait for it to happen now? Yeah. It's really going to be quite a spectacle to behold. But we've got to wait four billion years. So how big is the universe and how small can it really become? To answer those questions, let's go back a couple of thousand years in the past, in the days of Jesus, when a Greek philosopher was alive called Democritus. You know, Democritus thought when he looked at a structure like this library building, that it could be broken down into a tiny, basic, fundamental building block. He called it the Greek atomos, A-T-O-M-O-S, where we get our English word atom from. Atomos, literally defined, means indivisible. You've heard that word before, one nation under God, indivisible. Well, it means we can't divide it up any further. We can't break it apart any smaller. In the Latin, it means we can't cut it into smaller pieces. Wait a minute. Is that true of the atom? No, we know better, don't we? The atom can be split into subatomic particles. How many say we should change the name immediately, if not sooner? How many say no? Leave Adam alone. It's been with us 2,000 years. It's the way I learned it in school. It's the way my children learned it. It's the way my grandkids are learning it. How many say we should just leave Adam alone? Good news, everyone. We have left Adam alone. It's still in the dictionary of this library. It still means indivisible. It's still an atom. Gee, should we have applied that same reasoning to the planet Pluto? <laughs> Well, we can revisit that if you want to. Now, but going bigger, our bodies are made up of hundreds of trillions of cells, but an atom is much smaller than that. If we could put atoms across the thickness or diameter of one average human cell, how many do you think it would take? Oh, I like the way you think nice and big. You're not too far off, 100,000. Going bigger still, how many human cells will pile one on top of the other from the bottom of our feet all the way up to the top of our head, if we're average adult height, five foot eight inches. 100,000. Huh? Five minutes, yeah. If I go over a couple minutes, is that all right? It won't be much. I'll try. Okay. Oh boy, I guess we turn into pumpkins, all right. Well, my next question, how many, how many people standing on top of each other's head? Would it take, can you picture that, would stretch across the earth 8,000 miles wide? So how many volunteers, please? You guys are too, all right, there we go. How many volunteers are we going to need, Justin? Yeah, and there's an educated guess. We're on a trend here, right? But this is where the trend changes, I'm afraid. How many volunteers are we really going to need? 10 million. That's a lot of volunteers. I know if you feel sorry for that bottom one, boy, you're going to have a headache when this is done, right? Going bigger still, how many earths will go from the uh, sun to the edge of the solar system side by side. 10 million. Going bigger still, how many solar systems will go across the expanse of the Milky Way galaxy? From one spiral arm edge to the other, it's 100,000 light years across. Remember a light year 6 trillion miles? 600 quadrillion miles across the Milky Way. How many solar systems will go across that expanse? No, see this time the trend worked. You should have stuck with it. In other words, don't give up, right? And my largest question tonight is, how many Milky Way galaxies spiral arm edge to edge would it take to go across the entire known, detectable, observable universe in a three-dimensional understanding? How many think it's a really big number like that? Well, it makes sense in a way when you think about it, but you know what? This might seem a bit surprising. Yeah, so big is our Milky Way. But I'll tell you something more surprising than that, Going from the very small an atom to the very large, the entire cosmos, again, if we could, how many atoms would stretch across the entire universe? Well, wouldn't it be all these numbers multiplied together? 
Of course it would. Here's the number. <laughs> yeah, that's one followed by 36 zeros. One times 10 to the 36 power. They should have a TV show called Name That Number. Anybody know the name of that number? It's part of a Google. Not a Google Plex, but it's part of a Google. Those are two different numbers. Big difference in those numbers. But it's part of a Google. It's called one undecillion. One undecillion atoms would stretch across the entire universe. Good grief. Looking at it from another perspective, these are models of planets, size, scale, accurate. First going out in order from the sun, first Mercury, then Venus. Here we are, the third rock from the sun on Earth, and then Mars. And then, wait a minute, what's he doing here? How did Pluto sneak into this picture? Poor Pluto. He likes some equal time, wouldn't he? What does Pluto have in common with those other four worlds? Well, amongst a few things, they're all rocky, solid, terrestrial type worlds. They all have a solid ground to stand on. The other four don't. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune could fall through like a cloud. But not these. So who's the biggest one of our rocky, terrestrial worlds? Hey, we got bragging rights here, don't we? We're the biggest terrestrial planet in the whole solar system. Well, is it the Earth big? Oh, no, look at the Earth now. And look at poor Pluto reduced to the size of a pea on this scale compared to the Jovian worlds, the gas giant planets, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn without its rings. Look at Jupiter, the great red spot alone bigger than the Earth, a 300 mile an hour wind cyclonic storm discovered by Galileo Galilei over 400 years ago, still going on today, though it's beginning to diminish. We have no idea when it began before he found it. Well, all the other worlds combined don't equal the mass or volume of Jupiter, the biggest planet by far in the entire solar system. Isn't Jupiter big? Oh no, look at Jupiter now. And look at the Earth, a mere dot on this scale. Poor Pluto, a mere speck of dust compared to our star, the sun, over a million kilometers wide, 865,000 miles in diameter. The sun dwarfs the planets like little pebbles of rock. After all, the sun is a star, and on average, stars are enormous, the sun being no exception to that rule, like you may once have heard. Well, is it the sun big? No. Not really. Look at it compared to these stars. And isn't Arcturus here big? Not really. Look at Arcturus now. And isn't Antares big? No. Not really. <laughs> Let's watch this, shall we? Seen from Earth, our sun is a blinding ball of light. But take away the glare, and one of the most powerful objects in the universe appears in our own backyard. It's a ball of superheated gas that's been lighting our solar system for 4.6 billion years, and dominates all life on Earth. The sun is 93 million miles away, and that means in actuality, it's immense. You could fit a million Earths inside the sun. It's over a million kilometers in diameter. Yet our sun is tiny compared to the really big stars out there. Eta Carinae, over five million times larger than our sun. Betelgeuse, 300 times larger than Eta Carinae. If it was our sun, it would reach as far out as Jupiter. And then there's this monster, V.Y. Canis Majoris, the largest star ever discovered, a billion times bigger than our sun. It's true, everyone, the largest star discovered to date by astronomers, V.Y. Canis Majoris. And as the gentleman pointed out, a billion with a B times bigger than the sun. So galaxies containing hundreds of billions of stars from the smallest dwarfs to the largest supergiants, they form in these uh, clusters, even superclusters, containing thousands of galaxies. This Hubble Extreme D field image, we're seeing uh, galaxies out a distance of 13.2 billion light years. And with that, I'm going to conclude tonight's program. Thank you so much, everyone. Can we put the lights up and are there